All right, guys, let's finish topic four with 4.6. Today, we're going to talk about congruent and overlapping triangles. I've been telling you all year about the importance of the reflexive property and why we're going to be using it a lot. What we're going to do first, though, of course, is kind of look back on what we learned in our last class, which is our hypotenuse leg theorem. And I have uh, a question that says, which pair of triangles can be proven congruent using the hypotenuse leg theorem? Of choice A, B, C, and D. We're going to go through all of them, even though we're going to get the right answer before we can get through all of them. And then we're going to move on. So it says, again, which pair can be shown to be congruent using the hypotenuse leg theorem? And I'm going to look at them in order. So starting with A, I have to ask myself those three questions. The first question is, of course, are they both right triangles? Well, for A, question one is a yes. Second question is, are their hypotenuse congruent? And here, I can see that this is the hypotenuse because it's opposite the right angle, and it's congruent to the other hypotenuse. So for question number two, I can answer yes as well. And then my third pair, my third question is a pair of congruent corresponding legs. Sorry, I was running out of room there. So that says a pair of corresponding congruent legs. Well, if I were to rotate this figure so that my right triangle is down here, we would see that this would come around here. They are then therefore congruent and corresponding. So I can say yes. Let me actually write yes after I get rid of those. So for this one, my answer is definitely this. But let's look at why B, C, and D are not them, or not the correct answer. First question is satisfied. These are both right triangles, so I can say yes there. But I don't know anything about the hypotenuse of either of these triangles. All right. Are they congruent? Well, I don't know. So I cannot say. So I'm going to put cannot determine. I'm going to move on to C. Question one, are they both right triangles? Yes and yes. So that's a yes there. Are the hypotenuse congruent? Well, that's a yes and a yes. And last but not least, is there a pair of congruent corresponding legs? I don't know anything about this leg. I don't know anything about that leg, that leg, or that leg. So no, and therefore, HL cannot be determined. I'm slowly getting more specific as I go, just since this is a warm-up. For B, I just said this can't be determined because it failed step two. Now I've answered all three questions, and I'm saying no. The hypotenuse leg theorem cannot be determined because I don't have that third step there, the pair of congruent corresponding legs. And now let's look at D. So are they both right triangles? Yes and yes. And this is why I like the three questions. Because here, I can see I don't know anything about either of the hypotenuse. And since I don't know anything about them, I can say no. And then I don't have to move on, but I can see that, in fact, there are pairs of corresponding legs. But since I didn't get three yeses, again, hypotenuse leg, or therefore, that's what those three dots mean, hypotenuse leg cannot be determined. All right. So the next question says, if y equals 5, is there enough, is there sufficient information to show that ABC is congruent to triangle DEF? What I'm going to do is change colors here really quick. And we're going to look at that one. So here we now know y is equal to 5. So let's make that substitution. Oh. And it says, is there to show that they're congruent? Well, let's see what we have here. I see a right triangle on both of these. So that satisfies question 1. How about question 2? Well, if I go straight across from where my right angle is, I do have 
the hypotenuse being congruent. So I've got a second case for yes. And then I just have to see if three works. Oh, and I put y equals y. Instead of y equals five, I can see that this is already orientated, right? Because my arrow for my hypotenuse is pointing the same way. These are already in their corresponding parts. And so I can just check. The left-hand side and the left-hand side are both congruent. So I can say yes by HL. Now, in this class, that's all you need to do. Answer the three questions for me and then say yes. Since all three are yes, I can say they're congruent by the hypotenuse leg theorem. That's my full explanation there. I'm not asking for a full proof, but that is more than enough to explain it. Can I skip a slide? No. Okay, so it says figure ABCD is a rectangle. Notice we're moving on from just triangles. But if you look at the figure, I see four triangles. Actually, I see more than four triangles on the screen. But we'll get more into that as we go on throughout the year. Um, it says, why is it important to identify corresponding parts of overlapping triangles? So 4.1 through 4.5, what we really focused on were, we started with just what is congruency. We showed that congruency is just, a way to prove that rigid motions would map our pre-image onto our image. And then we moved into specific criteria so that we no longer had to physically manipulate or move these things to show that they would map onto each other. So we got those five criteria, side, 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 angle, side, angle, side, angle, 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 side, hypotenuse leg. We also learned that angle, angle, angle does not work for congruency, but we did say we're going to see it again in the future for similarity. And we learned that SSA, forwards or backwards, no bad words are allowed to be used. So we had some criterion that satisfied congruency. And then we had some things that would come up that wouldn't work for congruency. But sometimes they help you move on to planning your next move. What we're looking at now is just saying, can specific parts of a triangle be identified and then shown to be corresponding? And the most important thing here is when I'm reading this, this order has a lot of meaning and value to it. This is not written haphazardly or without meaning. All year when I've been doing this, I always show you, especially like in topic one where we're constructing these lines, that ABC means start at A, go to B, go to C. So triangle ABC, and then we can always loop right back around to C to A is this one. And so far I can see I have a right angle and a congruent side. And AC is going to be equal to AC by the reflexive property. But we don't know that we're going to need that yet, but it's always in the back of my mind. And it wants me to um, look at triangle DCB. So now I've got to follow that from D to C to B couple things to notice here. That letter in the middle is always your vertex. So that means I went from A, so this is my first move, A to B. Then, ooh, let's not do it in that color because we didn't do it in that color. So A to B, B to C, and then C back to A is in that order. Let's see if that lines up with this other triangle, DCB. So D to C is first. C to B is second, and then our hypotenuse is third. Notice here that when I did that, I can already see how to make these corresponding parts line up. And that's really convenient, right? I would just have to reflect one of these two over a line that goes right through here. And we now have proof that these will line up perfectly. So let's read the rest of this and see if that's where the author of this slide went. Identify the corresponding sides and angles in two triangles by first determining congruent parts. So we know that AB and DC are the same length and that conveniently maps with our one, our first step and first step, right? We're already showing that just by the order in which these are written and how we read them. The two angles ABC and DCB Notice, like I pointed out here, those in the middle, right? Angle B and angle C are in the middle, and they're right angles. They're congruent. That's our second 
step here of angle potentially side angle something or potentially angle angle side since these work forwards and backwards and now it says both a common side in both triangles is bc and cb we've been saying for a while now to keep an eye out for that reflexive property and what i've been saying so far is if I have something like um, AC, I can say it's congruent to AC, but I can also say they're congruent to CA. And if you think about why, now we're talking about length. Length is always positive. That means if I travel from A to C, it will be the same as C to A. No doubt about it. Really easy to see, right? Here we are, travel this way, get whatever we're after, turn around, travel back. We're gonna go the same distance. So, some of you guys are gonna be saying, but we didn't use that third piece of information, right? Where we went from C to A and B to D. Well. That's not going to be used here because they don't really have anything in common. Let me show you what I mean. So here is triangle ABC, and here's DCB. I can look at this, and I can see that I'm not going to really do anything with A or D because they're not part. They're not both part of the triangle, right? So that's gone. But here, just like I was talking about here, BC is congruent to CB, and that's this guy right here. So I've got one, I have a side here, I have an angle here, and I have a side here. And going in that same order, I have a side, an angle, and a side. So I can say these are congruent by side, angle, side. Now the nice thing about this is once I show that congruency, those two triangles are congruent, I can then start looking at what I have for the other two triangles, right? The one on the top and bottom that are pointing at each other. And I may be able to use the information I have here to prove that they're congruent to each other as well. We'll be doing that later. But for now, I just kind of want you to start getting into the habit of immediately considering the order in which these are written being extremely important when you're doing this. So you don't have to separate them and draw them. It's going to help you if you choose to do it. But if you really get used to reading these and what exactly they mean, you'll be much better off in this topic. I feel like I'm skipping a lot. Okay, what are the corresponding sides and angles of FHJ and KHG? So let me use the line tool this time. And we're gonna go FHJ in red. So that means I start at F, travel to J, I mean H, and then from H I travel to J. So from F to H, H to J, and remember we close the gap by going back from J to F. So that is our first triangle we're looking at. Now let's go green on K, H, G. So start at K, move to H, go to G, and back to K. The reason I like doing this in multiple colors is I can already kind of see what I've got going on here. And that is some congruency marks were already given to me for free. And let me show you which ones I'm seeing. Potentially, I need, I need to be able to figure out a way to see if these two are congruent, or co sorry, co corresponding. We know they're already congruent. Then I have something going on here. I have LJ, which has one tick mark. And I have FL, which has two, I'm just gonna put tick mark, right? So LJ, yeah, LJ and FL have those together. Since they're collinear, 
I can add these together and I can say that LJ plus FL are equal to FJ. And you might say, but I thought we had to make sure these have the corresponding ending points so we can add them together. Well, let's rearrange these because we already know LJ is equal to JL. So I can rewrite this as JL. Kind of talked about this on the previous slide, but it doesn't matter which way we travel along this line. They're the same length, so we have a lot of freedom here to do this. And then FL is the same as going L to F. So I can say plus L to F, and it becomes so much more obvious that our segment addition postulate works. So now that I know that FJ is equal to LJ plus FL, and I can come here and see that GL and LK has one tick mark plus two tick marks. So again, Collinear, they're congruent to uh, my other part. So now I can say this right here is just equal to G to K all the way across. And since this has one tick mark and this has two tick marks, this has one tick mark and two tick marks, I can also say that J F is congruent to G K. And let me erase some of these circles really quick and we can just talk about that again. Let me show it to you with numbers. Let's say that if it has one tick mark, then its length is one. And if it has two tick marks, then its length is two. So now we can see much more easily that GL plus LK must be equal to JL plus LF. And let's do it all the way. GL has one tick mark, so it has a length of one. LK has two tick marks, so it has a length of two. JL has a length of one according to the tick marks. And LF has a length of two. And I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me that 3 is equal to 3. So right now, if we look at my red triangle and we look at my green triangle, we can see that GK and JF are equal. And that's going to mean to me, I'm going to want to rotate one of those if I was doing this as a rigid motion to get them to line up with each other. Now, even if I do rotate this one slightly, Let's go with the red one. And I'm just going to say if we rotate the red line or the red triangle, and they have that as FHG, rotate, and we're just going to say some sort of positive degrees around L, triangle FHJ, we can see that as this rotates, that's going to be negative. Well, it doesn't matter. Even though if we go all the way this way and come back here, eventually we'll be able to get these two to line up, but with their opposite pair, and then we could reflect it, and they'll be on top of each other in a corresponding way. What that does for me now that I can see that is that's going to flip this one to here, and now I know F is congruent to K. And when these flip, the shorter sides of my triangle, HJ and GH, we can also say are corresponding. Can't say they're congruent yet because we don't have that information, but we can say HG and HJ are corresponding. So let me clear this and let's just talk about it one more time without all of this stuff all over it. Now that I've kind of convinced you that these are all congruent, what I'm saying is if I break this up, let's say I rotate this triangle here, this direction, so that 
this and this are lined up with each other and this and this are lined up with each other. That means I would have created uh, GK and FJ to be collinear, right? They're going to be on top of each other. And then I'll have F over here. And I will just have to do some sort of reflection to get F over here. And then I can see that once this flips over here, K and F are given to me to be congruent. And FJ is corresponding and congruent to GK. And all I have left is that one side that I didn't deal with. That's HJ and HG. Now be careful, we're not saying they're congruent. We're saying they are corresponding. So this one is a little bit more complicated to do strictly in your head. I see that a lot of students, a lot of times, like to see these broken up. And not that I'm the best at drawing triangles, but what I'm gonna do one last time on this example, just to show you yet another way to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and draw FHJ. F is already over here. H is up top and J is on the bottom. And I'm gonna draw KHG. Now I am doing myself a small favor when I rewrite these and I am mostly orientating them in an easy way to see their corresponding parts. K goes here. Oh, that's not a K, that's H goes up top. And G goes down here. And let's just double check that. If I come here, between G and K, I'll find point L. So let's go ahead and put that on there just to make sure I'm right. Let's do it in a different color so we can kind of see and between F and J, I'll find point L. Now I'm using point L as my anchor point here, right? It's not actually anything to do with these triangles. It's a point on GK, that's fine, but it doesn't change my triangle FHJ or KHJ. What it does is give, gives me a reference point to look at to make sure I'm setting this up properly and that these are orientated somewhat in the right way. Because I've done this and they're both at the bottom and they're within the right limit, I can go ahead and come in here and let's do something a little bright. I know that G to L is one tick mark and I know that J to L is one tick mark. And I know that L to F is two tick marks. And I know that L to K is two tick marks. This is starting to look even better to me about this being set up properly and I'm going to show you why as soon as I get through this congruency part right here which is much easier right we just going to mark F and K now if you're looking at this and you felt pretty good about topic three you can see right away without a shadow of a doubt that if I were to find the appropriately distance line here and reflect this over everything would map on perfectly right my F would land on K my FL, which is two tick marks, would come over here and be on LK. And I'm doing, I feel much more confident after seeing that, right? I think this is the best way to go about it. Save the best for last. And that's just because I want you to see this progressively getting easier and easier. You're going to get to the point where you can look at this problem. And you can kind of draw this out in your head. You may not do that before this test. You may slowly be getting there by the time you take the midterm. But when you get to the EOC in the final, I would try and do this in my head. Look at my choices if it's multiple choice. On my scratch paper, mark down potentially C, if that was an option, right? I could say potentially C. Let's say this is question 23 on the EOC or final. Then I can draw it like this. And I can verify, right? I built in my check. I built in some redundancy. I've done it two different ways. And then I can move on. But 
I think it's so much easier to see that these are the corresponding parts here. And let's just label them one more time. So what parts correspond? H, J, and H, G. And notice these meet here and here, so that's a really good sign that we've done it right as well. I'm going to go ahead, since we've already shown that F, J, and G, K are the same. F, J, and G, K. And that means that F, H, and H, K Go ahead and mark these properly. And those are my corresponding sides. What are my corresponding angles? Well, we can see F and K, and that's just given right away off the bat. J and G. And I think most obviously H and H. H is always going to be equal to itself. They share that part. That is called the common part of the triangle, angle H. Both triangles have that angle, and it's the exact same measurement within both triangles. That's really important to remember. When you have something like this, this is called the shared angle or the shared side. You're going to see a lot of this in your homework tonight, so kind of make sure you see that. All that's saying is that angle exists in both triangles, and they're exactly congruent. All right, so my question to you guys is, is EGD congruent to EFH? And this is a fun one. Let's pull up our pen. So I'm just going to highlight this for you to get you started. And then I want you to read this and see if you can make sense of it. Is EGD, so that means start at E, go to G, and then move to D. And then since it's EGD, I have to close the polygon. That means go from D back to E. And... Is that congruent to E, F, H? So here we have E to F to H. And since we're going E to F to H, close the polygon by going from H to E. And we're starting to see something here. We were just talking about shared angles. Here's our shared side. And it's only a segment of a shared side, right? FG, I'm going to call this FG for purple because it's in the purple triangle, is congruent to FG in the red triangle by the reflexive property of congruency. So our purple triangle, so our whole overall triangle is an isosceles. If we look at what we originally started with, and let me highlight that, I guess, in a different color. Let's go pink from here to here to here, right? This angle is equal to this angle because those sides are equal. So this is an isosceles. So I can already look at my overall triangle and say that this and this angle are congruent. And right now, I have side, angle, side, side, angle, side. So we know that this is congruent. And because corresponding parts are congruent, triangles are congruent, or CP, CTC, we can say that these are in fact both congruent to each other. Read through that and see if you understand it. What I really didn't get into, right? We said this part. Does that part make sense? Let me know if you have any questions. Put them in the comments below. All right. Here's a fun one. Make sure you consider your given. 
verify that on the diagram they've satisfied all the requirements for your givens. I'm seeing three things. AB is congruent to DC. I'm also seeing that AF is congruent to DE. And last but not least, angle A is congruent to angle D. And what it wants us to do is prove BFE. So let's do that one. So start at B, go to F. From F, go to E. So B, F, E. And then E says go back to B. And then here in red, we are going to start at C, go to E, then go to F. Let's overshoot it just a little bit for clarity. And this one should be a little easier for you. I'm just going to give you a few hints. If these angles are congruent, and we can see here that angle ABF is congruent to, so let's make sure we're writing this in the right order. Starting at the angle marker, going up to B. So start at the angle and cross the first line. That means start at the angle, cross the first line, D, C, E. This order matters and it will always matter. So be careful when you're doing this. But since these are equal, these are equal. And this right here, we know by side angle side, just from what's given, now that we can make this statement, we can also say side, side, side. So remember, once we show one, we can show all of them. But that's not what it's asking us to prove, is it? We know the two on the outside are congruent. What do you guys know about the ones on the inside? We got that step done. And there's really nothing else to do, right? They're inside here. So AF and DE. And now we know FE is going to be congruent to FE. So this is already given to us right here. So we put this mark at the bottom. We already know these two are congruent. And since this was already congruent here, this one and this one are congruent. So again, we have side angle side. This really does feel like a champ of what we're doing. Let me show you why it's side angle side though. And thank you for those of you who paused the video and actually thought this one through. But we've already said because this angle is congruent to this angle, these sides are congruent. Now, we also know that FE, sorry, is congruent to FE. Now, when I come back here, remember I said the order is really important. Notice that FE and EF are in the same position when we wrote this triangle out. And we know that FE is congruent to EF. Now, as some of you guys advance, you're going to be able to see other things here by what's given and be able to do this really without even looking at the diagram. This one's a little bit too complicated for that right now because there's so much going on. But you should be able to look at this and say, oh, FE and EF, it doesn't matter the order. It's the same length between those two endpoints. We can already say that they have something in common there with their sides. I'm going to put, well, this should be two tick marks, I guess. So let's put three here. And right now we have a side and a side. But remember, if this side is congruent to this side, and the angles that generated them are congruent. So now we have side, angle, side. And here we have the same thing in that order, a side, an angle, oops, A for angle, and that shared side. So you're not cheating the system here by using FE and EF to be congruent to themselves. It just makes everything so much easier and you can see that stuff like triangle BGC, not even necessary. We didn't need to connect those. That could be gone, right? I can do this. I think so, yeah. Like that's not of any use to us. That's just an extra line to make us distracted a little bit. 
but like I said, four six, not too hard. This one is for you guys. And I want you to start getting ready to answer this one in the chat below. This is how I'm taking your participation since I can't be there today. If you have commented, just put either your first initial, last initial, and yes or no, and we're good to go on this one. Just so you can see what I mean by that, let's say my name was Tom Haverford. I would put T, oh, still on white. That's not going to help. My name was Tom Haverford. I put T, H, and then yes, no. All right. That's how you're getting your participation today. Go ahead and pause the video here to record these three theorems. And then we'll move on. All right. So you have three questions on the board. Pick two and answer them by putting a private class comment on Google Classroom where I posted today's video. Go ahead and start your 4.6 homework. It is extremely short because you're just going to be doing a lot of what are the shared sides, what are the shared angles, what are the corresponding parts, what are the corresponding congruent parts, and are these triangles congruent, yes or no. Make sure you're reading them in order. A, B, C, and B, C, A are two different triangles as far as congruency is concerned because you're looking at line segment A, B, then B, C, then C, A, Versus, what did I say before, B, C, A? So then you're looking at B, C, C, A, A, B. Those will not be congruent in the same order because the sides are not. Unless it's an isosceles or an equilateral, potentially. But that is the end of 4.6. Once you finish the homework, if you still have time in class, start your review. That will also be posted. And I'll have the bonus questions up on Wednesday.